Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Marty Chan. I'm an author, a playwright, and a storyteller. And thanks to Orca, I'm able to do a little virtual author chat with all of you today. Um, I'm actually doing this broadcast from my home office in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, this is normally where I would do my writing, uh, but now I've converted this into my virtual broadcast studio. In fact, let me let me give you a quick tour of my space. So uh, right over here, this is where I do all my writing. And uh, you see right under Batman, I've got uh, my file holders with all the projects that I'm working on. And if I can turn on my other light, you can see there's my printer where I print out my manuscripts. And right beneath uh, that, there's my bookcase with all the reference books that I use when I'm working on my novels. Now, because of the pandemic, I've had to pivot and start using this space in a different way and namely turn this into a virtual broadcast studio. That's why I've added some extra lights and some additional cameras. And in fact, uh, let me give me a wider view of my space. So uh, you see right behind me, I've got a backdrop and that's supposed to hide the basement that I have. Uh, the basement, which was decorated in the height of the 1970s. So there's a lot of uh, red uh, shag carpeting behind me, as well as some uh, wood paneling from the 70s. Uh, now, this has become my virtual presentation space. Now, in addition to doing uh, live virtual visits, I, I've also uh, taken to YouTube to make short uh, writing uh, videos or writing tip videos to help students uh, become better writers and help teachers uh, come up with resources to be able to help their students become better writers. And uh, right over here is my YouTube studio. By the way, my channel is Marty Chan Author if you want to check it out. But this is where I shoot my YouTube videos. In addition, I have a little reading nook where I do my reading performances so that people get a sense of what my books are about. Now I'm going to show you a different space of mine, not a physical space, a digital space. It's my digital library where I keep all the important information. This is where I collect all my experiences, my ideas, the books that I've worked on. Oh, there's my cat. Very important. Became the inspiration for one of my books. Oh. What's that doing there? Well, I guess you can tell that writers tend to procrastinate. Uh, let's see, let's see. Ah, yeah, there we go, right over here. I'm gonna talk about this book right here, but let me get rid of my library first. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about this book right here. So this is my book, Kylie the Magnificent, which is about a young girl named Kylie who wants to break into the world of stage magic. But um, when she auditions for a talent show for magicians, she discovers that the director of the show has some old world views about magic, in particular when it comes to women. He believes that Kylie and other girls make better assistance to magicians because they can wear sparkly dresses to distract the audience while the male magician does the real work. Now, this riles Kylie to no end, and she thinks that women, girls are capable of anything guys are capable of, and she aims to prove this director wrong. Kylie teams up with her best friend, Min, to put together a magic act to impress the director. And Kylie is going to be the lead magician while her friend Min will play the assistant. Now, as they're trying to brainstorm the act that they're going to put together, Kylie and Min decide that they're going to pay, play, pay tribute to the world famous magician Harry Houdini. And they decide to pay tribute by doing one of Houdini's um, famous tricks. But instead of doing one of his magic tricks, they opt to focus on his work as an escape artist. Now, Houdini was famous for escaping from handcuffs, shackles, ropes, and most famous of all, a straitjacket. And so Kylie and Min decide to put together their own escape act where uh, Kylie will be uh, handcuffed and put in a mail sack and have to be able to escape from it. But unfortunately, as they put together their act and rehearse it, 
the two have a difference of opinions on how things are supposed to go uh, supposed to go their egos clash and they have a falling out not only does kylie have to win over the director of the talent show but she also has to win back her best friend min and that is basically what my book is about <music> Okay, so what I'm going to do for you now is a little bit of magic. Uh, let's see, what can I do? What can I do? Ah, uh, you know what? I'm going to make my book appear in my hand right here. All right, so let's get ready for it. A little bit of magic. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess I've got some snacks on my brain right now. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. I'll make my book appear in my hand. Here we go. A little bit of magic. Uh, okay, okay. I really should have had breakfast before I did this session. Or maybe I, I really should eat healthier. Maybe some fruits and vegetables. Okay, okay, here we go. I'm going to need more than a little bit of magic for this. I'm going to need a lot of magic. Here we go. A lot of... Something seems odd. Where, where's the book? And why do I smell vegetables? Wait a minute. That's me! No! Okay, okay, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. All right, uh, so uh, as you probably can guess by now, I, I, I always try to find different ways to engage reluctant readers. Uh, I've found that kids tend to look at books as inanimate or inert objects, and they don't feel like they can connect to those books very much. And so I find that a good way to inspire those kids to want to pick up a book and give it a read is try to animate the book, uh, dramatize it, bring it to life for the students. When I was doing my live presentations, I would find different ways to connect with the kids by bringing props in that were connected to the book. I would do uh, different presentations where I could dramatize scenes from the book. And when the kids could actually see that the uh, experience of the book was more than just sitting and reading, that it was actually something three-dimensional and fun, the kids became more engaged and more interested, and they would line up at the library counter to pick up my books. In fact, uh, I wrote a book uh, about Harry Houdini, not Kylie the Magnificent, but a book before that, and it was aimed at teens and and. I foolishly decided the best way to engage the kids was to actually perform a straitjacket escape. So I learned how to do a straitjacket escape and went into schools and did that like three or four times a day, uh, which really hurt my shoulder. I'm, I'm thankful that I'm now doing virtual visits, so I don't have to do that kind of stuff anymore. But I have to say, I love when I'm able to make a connection with those kids who are reluctant readers. I, I know that there are kids who are avid readers and it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but you have a very, uh, a smooth ride when it comes to getting those kids excited about reading a particular book. For me, the challenge is those kids who go, I hate books. Now, Part of it could be that they just don't like sitting still. Part of it could be they have some learning difficulties. In fact, I know this from personal experience because I started off as a reluctant reader. My parents were immigrants from China. So when they came to Canada, um, my mom didn't speak or read English. My dad bought a grocery store, so he didn't have time to sit down with me and teach me how to read. So when I went to school, I was behind in reading level from my other students. And I was embarrassed and I didn't like reading. In fact, the only thing that was even close to a book that landed in my hand was a Chinese comic book. Now, I'll tell you how I got my hands on this. Now, now my parents own the grocery store in a small town just north of the capital city of Alberta. Uh, the town's called Morinville and the capital city is Edmonton. And every Sunday, my parents would close the store, drive to Edmonton to Chinatown where they'd pick up groceries from the Chinese grocery store. 
Now, it just so happened that uh, the grocery store was on the main floor of a two-story building. And on the second floor was a Chinese restaurant that served dim sum, which is Chinese brunch. Like servers would roll out carts and you would order the pastries or treats off those carts. And uh, you would be able, be able to have your own serving of dim sum. Now, because this was the only Chinese restaurant serving dim sum, it was pretty popular and people had to line up the stairwell and wait their turn to get to a table. Now, I was an impatient kid and I was constantly asking, you know, are we there yet? When is the table going to be open? I'm hungry. Can we eat now? Now, my dad had a short fuse and I was probably about two questions away from my dad giving me a cuff upside the head. My mom, being ever the diplomat, reached into her purse, pulled out a couple of quarters and said, Marty, go to the grocery store, get yourself some candy. Well, you didn't have to tell me twice. I made a beeline into the store for my favorite candy. It, they were called Ha Flakes. Now, Ha Flakes are kind of like Chinese fruit roll-ups, but they're shaped like quarters. They're kind of a reddish purple. They stain your lips forever. I'm pretty sure they're carcinogenic. I'll find out in a couple of years, but I love them. And I remember I went uh, to line up to pay for the Ha Flakes. Now, while I was in line, I noticed there was a table laid out with Chinese newspapers and magazines and comic books. Now, I can't read Chinese, but the comic I saw grabbed my attention. Uh, it wasn't in full color. They were sort of line drawings, and it was about like a Laurel and Hardy duo, or if you're of a different generation, Beavis and Butthead. And so these two characters got into all sorts of hijinks. And I started flipping through the pages, and I, I liked the images so much that I actually put the Hoff Lakes back and I bought this comic. They're called Old Master Q. And uh, I couldn't wait until the uh, next week when I could go back to Chinatown and get the next copy of Old Master Q. Unfortunately, that comic only came out once every two months. So I couldn't get a comic that week. But I noticed across the street, there was a drugstore. And I thought the drugstore might have some comics. So I went across the street to the drugstore, walked up and down the aisles, finally found a magazine rack that had uh, home and garden magazines, car magazines, uh, beauty magazines. There, there were these weird magazines wrapped in plastic that the men seemed really interested in. To this day, I still don't know what those magazines were. But right beside the magazine rack, I saw the comic book rack. But these comics were different. They weren't funny. They were in full color. And they were about superheroes in costumes fighting crime. There was the Flash, Batman, uh, Superman, and Spider-Man. I liked the notion of these comics, so I got as many as I could, and I paid for them. Now, at school, I would walk around with the comics stuck in between my scribbler. My teacher saw that I was behind in reading, so I was teamed up with the school librarian. The teacher librarian had to help me catch up on my reading skills. But she noticed that I had my comics. And she said, Marty, how would you like to learn how to read those comic books of yours? And at that point, she became the coolest school librarian in the world. I said, yes, I want to learn how to read my comics. And she said, I will teach you how to read your comics, but we're going to start by reading my comic. And she introduced me to a classics illustrated called The Count of Monte Cristo. And we started reading together and I started learning some pretty complicated words. And I found that The Count of Monte Cristo, the classics illustrated had way more text than my comics, right? The dialogue bubbles were bursting. The caption boxes were full. And as I was reading, I started to learn that, that there was more to the story than just the pictures on the page. The whole new world opened up and I wanted to read as much as I could. Now, at a certain point, my teacher librarian thought it was time for me to graduate from comics to chapter novels. And I was a little nervous because I liked the illustrations. But my librarian read me pretty well. She said, don't worry, the book I selected for you has some illustrations in them. And it's about two they're kind of like superheroes, crime fighters, just like in your comic books. They're two brothers who solve mysteries in a small town. And their names are Frank and Joe. The series was The Hardy Boys. And as soon as I started reading those books, I fell in love with reading. And I have been reading ever since. 
To me, that's the importance of being able to hook a reluctant reader. Find a way that you can connect their interests with the books that they could read. And when you find that connection, they become lifelong readers. But it does take a little work. It just you have to find their interest. And sometimes you have to do things to spark their curiosity. And speaking of sparking their curiosity, I see that we're almost out of time, but I did want to save some time for questions and answers. So I'm going to bring up uh, my slide. And uh, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to type them in chat or in the Q&A. All right. Are there any questions from the group? I'm ready. I have one for you. Um, as an author, do you have any thoughts on the reason middle grade kids often drift away from reading for pleasure? Oh, yeah. Uh, my, my theory about why middle grade kids uh, drift away from reading for pleasure is that sometimes uh, teachers in, in, in trying to multitask, they take books and try to use them as part of the sort of teaching lesson in class. So, so we see more books being used for good purposes to teach. But for a kid at a certain point, it's a bit heavy, right? In the sense that, oh, I got to read a book and now I've got to figure out who these characters are. I need to know what's going on. And on the other side, you've got YouTube, Netflix, uh, all these sort of visual mediums where they can just sit down and watch. And so I find that if you find read, find ways to make reading more fun. I mean, I, I always try to disguise uh, educational lessons in the form of games. And so if there is an opportunity to get those kids to read just for fun, like it, it may be part of a lesson, but make it an active and fun part of a lesson. So for example, with uh, my book, sometimes when I go in and do writing workshops, I, I pick a scene and I tell the kids, let's try to dramatize the scene. Let's act it out. And the one thing that you find that's amazing is that when you've got kids who are natural showmen, natural actors. They love the idea of being in the spotlight. And so suddenly the act of reading isn't about, oh, I got to read to learn something. It's about, hey, I get to be the star of a show. And suddenly they're reading for fun, even though there's a purpose behind it. That is great, great advice. Thank you so much. Okay, I have another one for you. Um, Kylie Mag the Magnificent has a really realistic portrayal of friendship it's not always smooth. What was your inspiration for this conflict? <laughs> my inspiration for that conflict is the inspiration for most of my books. Uh, I rated my own life experiences for uh, the book. So I did have moments in my life where there were challenges that I had with my friends where we had different opinions. And of course, when you're young, you don't have the skill set to be able to go, let's negotiate and find a compromise. It's just two people who want different things. And they clash. And so, um, okay, I'll get specific. Uh, I had a best friend named Jay and, uh, we had a falling out over, uh, I don't know. Does anyone still play risk? Uh, the game of risk, uh, trying to conquer the world. We had a little falling out over risk. Never, never play risk with your friends. You can play with your family. Cause when you fight with your family, you can hold grudges forever, but <laughs> at least you're still together. Uh, so we had a falling out over the rules of risk. And I do remember there was a board flipped over and pieces went flying. Uh, so that was the inspiration behind the uh, sort of disintegrating friendship between Kylie and Min. All right, Jay and Marty, <laughs> trials and tribulations. Uh, okay, we've got time for one more question, I think. Um, how does writing high-low fiction compare to writing at level fiction? Oh, uh, the whole notion of writing uh, uh, sort of high-low fiction, I, I think one of the things that for, for authors that we always have to keep in mind is that if you're writing something for somebody who's reading at a lower level, it doesn't mean that they're reading at a lower social or intelligence level. So I think the thing that we always have to keep in mind is that you're still writing to somebody who wants a story. They want a good story. And if it's a 13 or 14 year old, they don't want something that's written for a seven or eight year old. They want a story that matters to them at their age. And so when I tackle like a high low book, I don't think about the vocabulary. I don't think about the reading level. I first think about the story and how does it connect with somebody of that age? And 
And the thing that I love is that when you can find that story, there are many different ways that you can tell the story. So you can tell it with lower vocabulary. You can take it with higher vocabulary. But if at the heart of it, there's like a human conflict, human drama that the uh, kids can relate to, they're going to engage no matter what the reading level is. That's great. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to have to wrap it up now. But thank you so much, Marty. That was an amazing presentation. And thanks, everybody who joined. And please, if you haven't come by the ORCA booth, please uh, check us out. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Take care, one and all.